Chapter 1 Gavrik, Sweden An elk runs along the snow-plowed road, searching frantically for her lost calf. Panic in her eyes, myriad headlights picking out that panic. The thick scent of exhaust fumes. I slow my helix truck and switch on my hazard lights. The traffic on the other side is still moving. Drivers, desperate to exit these bleak winter roads and retreat to their apartments, their 21st century caves. The calf looks light as air. It is running, legs long and fragile, and it is desperate to be reunited with its beloved mother, its sole protector in this cold, dark wilderness. A Volkswagen slows and hoots its horn. A teenager hangs out of the back window, filming the towering mother elk on his phone. I look down on this behaviour, and yet, at the same time, I know I will likely be using that same footage later this evening for the paper, crediting the very same teenager. Complicit. The cow elk summons an ungodly noise and runs onto the asphalt, falling, scrambling to stand back up, the calf lost among the mayhem, the halogen-lit chaos. A man yells something unintelligible from his lorry cab. The calf stops dead for a moment. Its mother trots down into a ditch, nostrils steaming, and someone overtakes me, beeping like this whole scene is an inconvenience, and I am struck, not for the first time, by the spectrum of priorities I witness from my fellow humans. Money, power, convenience, Comfort. Kindness. White light split through a prism into its many constituent parts. A grey sob on the other side of the road skids on a patch of black ice and then recovers. The cow elk makes one last effort to run across the road, to risk everything for her offspring, and a Ford pickup breaks hard, swerving, missing the beast by a fraction. The elk bolts across in front of me. The Ford crashes down into a ditch, dirty slush water erupting from its bonnet, red lights glowing through the mist at head height. The elk family are lost to the forest in seconds, running, together, nature corrected, back into the shadowy world of Utgard Forest. You might try to search for a larger, denser forest than Utgard, but you will likely never find one. The driver of the Ford is okay. Wet and cold, but okay. I have already called Tord at the police station. My hearing aid synced to my phone. He will probably drive by for ten minutes, but this is more a job for a tow truck than law enforcement. Traffic resumes. I make a turn and head back to Gavrik town. My home. The place the world forgot. A marginal settlement surrounded by vast forests, hunters and salt licorice, more than our fair share of darkness. We haven't had much news these past two years, truth be told. Quiet place, time to heal. I drive between McDonald's and Ica Maxi, the two gateposts of Gavrik, and snow begins to fall. December flurries are always welcome. Check back again in March, when my fellow Swedes are dreaming of moving south to Spain, or maybe Malmö. I moved here years ago, when Mum was ill. After she passed away, I just kind of stayed. Don't ask me why. No, in fact, do ask me. Because the people I care about live in this desolate place. It is as simple and as complicated as that. I go on. Pensioners wearing more layers than most people on this planet would ever contemplate. Merino wool as life support. Streetlights forming halos within pale clouds of snowflakes. A young man pulling his weekly shop home on a sledge. The long stem weeds on the roadside, despised all summer, are admired now that they are adorned with ice crystals. I spot Tammy's food truck in the distance. She will be in there listening to 90s dance classics and slicing chilies and spring onions. My best friend in the world. My sister in all but blood. 
Tammy will be refining her bone broths and cleaning out her rice cookers, working culinary magic inside a van in the most inauspicious corner of a car park. An unlikely hero, but a hero nonetheless. Past Benny Bjorn Mossen's hunt shop, the stuffed brown bear looking back, judging me. Hunting is the main pastime here in Gavrik, so Benny does well, although he'll never say as much. Past the police station and through the long shadows cast by the twin chimneys of the Grimberg Licorice Factory, our largest and oldest employer. Welcome to Toy Town. Population, 8,000 souls. Most of them lost, or on their way there. I head into Gavrik Posten, and the bell above the door tinkles. Lars looks up from whatever Jedi-level Sudoku he's currently working on. I start peeling off layers and slipping off my snow boots. My blonde ponytail feels more disheveled and dry than it usually does, and that is saying something. Elk, out on the Utgard Road, almost hit a truck. Lars, as a general rule, takes a while to react. He used to be the sole full-time reporter here until I took over, and he's much like an old-fashioned vinyl record playing at half speed. I take my gloves off, and then, after a moment, he says, Elk? Cow, with her calf on the other side of the road, both looked panicked. Almost hit a truck, he says. Truck's in a ditch. Everyone's okay. Everyone is okay, he repeats, like he's trying to reassure himself of the fact. Liana is back in her office, fixing for the print. And Nils is in his, trying to sell ad space to the same poor axe shop owners and hairdressers he's been trying to sell ad space to for years. Swedes don't bother so much with hairstyling in the dark months, you see. Not in rural parts. If you have your skull encased in a woolly hat all day, every day, why would you even bother? The office smells of coats drying out. I open up my last file and turn down the volume on my new hearing aids. They are superior to my old pair in almost every way. Battery life, interference, water resistance. But they hurt. Every night when I return home, I pull them out as soon as I open my door, and the relief is immediate. One piece of breaking news grabs my attention. It scrolls across the base of my screen. Deaf teenager goes missing in Essebari. Police believe he has no money with him or contacts outside of Essebari town. Mountain Rescue are launching a search party, but conditions hinder their efforts. The deaf teenager is described as vulnerable. The tunnel is being kept open all night as an exception. Chapter 2 